Good evening, everyone. Good evening. If I'm too loud, just put your hands on your ears, because I'm used to working without a mic. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the Disasters of War Forum. Uh, we're going to have two speakers speak here tonight. If you read our leaflet, Susan Stahl is going to speak on the legacy of Agent Orange, both in American veterans and their families, and the Vietnamese, their land, and their families. And now we're experiencing the third generation of people affected by that toxin. And our hometown guy, Nick Latter, will be speaking on the proliferation of drones around the world and the dastardly deeds that they're doing and in our name with our tax dollars. I also wanted to make a couple of announcements. Uh, this year, we will be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the World War I Christmas truce. It happened in Belgium between the German and the English troops. And uh, it, it will be 100th year from World War I, 1918. I'm sorry, 1914 was when that happened. We have these orange parts here on the back table. I would ask you to please consider filling one out and we'll get to your U.S. representative. I've already had discussions myself and another Vietnam vet with Elliot Engel, if you're in his district, and it was mostly positive, although there was no commitments. And we met with the congressman himself, that staff. On April 26th at Judson Memorial, there will be a group of veterans that want to tell the true story about Vietnam. It's called the Full Disclosure of the American War in Vietnam. It's at Judson Memorial Church on April 26th at 5.30 p.m. in the evening. And the next day there will be meeting the same group at the Vietnam Veterans uh, Memorial Plaza in Manhattan, which is located adjacent to 55 Water Street. Uh, another date I want to bring to your attention is August the 10th. It's Agent Orange Day, when there will be many things going on in this country and internationally in memory of the horrific legacy of Agent Orange toxins that still we live with today. August the 10th is also the 50th anniversary of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was built based on false information and severely mobilized millions of people that probably didn't need to be mobilized into that quagmire we call Vietnam. It was the American War in Vietnam. And also, if you would uh, want to get information on a lot of these issues, there's a sign up for CFOW, the Concerned Families of Westchester and back, and we appreciate it if you want to get information like that. I know I like getting Frank's emails because it reminds me of a lot of things I want to do or should be doing. Anyway, without further ado, I want to bring forward Susan Schnall, and the format tonight, we're going to have Susan and Nick both present, and then we're going to have a uh, Q&A for the both of them uh, combined. And I think a lot of these issues are overlapping, so it should be an interesting uh, conversation after their presentation. And I think I'm going to learn things I don't know about both drones and Agent Orange, and I've been chasing Agent Orange myself on and off sporadically for about 40 years. I know people affected by it, both vets and Vietnamese. So anyway, without further ado, this is Susan Schnall, and she read the leaflet. She's been quite an activist for many, many years. Thank you, Susan. Good evening. It's wonderful to see you all tonight, to come and hear once again the story of the lasting legacy of the war in Vietnam, and that's the story of Agent Orange. There were about 20 million gallons of Agent Orange that were dropped over South and Central Vietnam. There are remaining today about 28 contaminated sites that have been identified. And those are the sites where the United States military had its bases. They still remain contaminated. Some of you may have heard about recent legislation that's been passed to clean up one of the bases, which is the Bank Air Force Base. It's the only one for which there have been monies allocated. It's around 60, 70 million dollars, again, very specifically for Da Nang Air Force Base, because there's a lot of commercial flights going on, because 
there is now been a reconciliation between the United States government and the Vietnamese government. For the past 15 years, there are ongoing trade negotiations, and I know George, you got in the middle of it with Elliot Engel and TPP. So there are a lot of things that are going on, but what I'd like to focus on tonight is the legacy of Agent Orange. And just tell you a little bit about what happened from 1961 to 1975. Agent Orange, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard this, was used as a defoliant. It was used to destroy the vegetation in South and Central Vietnam. And the reason for it was, one, to deny coverage to, quote, the enemy, so that you could see the enemy, because if you had the intense vegetation, you couldn't. The other was to destroy the land and destroy the food supply. And just think about that, and the devastating impact. Um, and it continues today. So Agent Orange was produced by about 18 different American chemical companies. The major ones were Dow, and Monsanto. All of you know about Monsanto today, right, with the organically, the genetically modified organisms. Let me just tell you that Monsanto today has offices in Ho Chi Minh City and a contract now to be able to produce rice and corn. Kind of extraordinary how when they weren't able to destroy what was going on in Vietnam and the liberation and independence by the Vietnamese that they now go back. So we continue to have to deal with this issue. During the conflict in Vietnam, there was a huge momentum to produce more and more of Agent Orange. Dioxin was produced as an adjunct. It was part of the production methods. It was not supposed to, it was a contaminant, right? In the production. And the chemical companies knew that dioxin was a contaminant. They knew that it was causing liver cancers in their own employees. They knew that it was causing chloracne in their own employees. Um, and they continued to produce it. There is a memo that came out between Dow and Monsanto that said, yes, we know dioxin is a contaminant and is part of the production. We cannot slow down production because the government keeps demanding more and more. Um, we cannot let this information get out to the American public because if it does, it will slow down our production and it will slow down our profits. Nothing much has changed. We have that in writing. It was information that was produced during the court hearings where we had a class action suit by a group of Vietnamese nationals against the chemical companies. It was thrown out of court by Judge Weinberg in Brooklyn. It was then appealed to the Second Circuit and it was also thrown out there. So now we are working on legislation and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. First, I wanted to show you some pictures of children who have been impacted by the use of the Agent Orange dioxin. Because as George mentioned, the devastating impact remains today. Today, Veterans Affairs acknowledges that there are about 18 different illnesses for which American soldiers who served in Vietnam will be compensated. It accepts that there are these illnesses that range from respiratory cancers, from lymphomas and leukemia, to skin diseases, chloracne, um, the list goes on. The reason that this list has been identified is that there were public health studies that were done that showed a correlation between exposure and the incidence of disease. So it's not as though you can go in and draw somebody's blood and say, okay, they have levels of dioxin in it. It was a correlation 
that was done between you went to Vietnam, you developed these diseases, therefore we will say we will compensate you. So American veterans are compensated. The children of American female veterans are also compensated for about 14 different types of what we call neural tube defects. So about 14 different diseases. I should also mention that there were about six, 7,000 women who were in Vietnam. So it's not a huge number when you think about the government saying, okay, we're going to compensate this number of people, of soldiers who were affected, this number of children of American female veterans. The only diagnosis for which the children of American male veterans who served in Vietnam are compensated is spina bifida. It is a small number. The government does not acknowledge that there is any correlation between the incidence of these diseases and service in Vietnam. But they say because the numbers are so high, we will accept that and we will compensate. So those are the issues, some of them, that remain on the table today. As I said, there is not a blood test that we can do to say, yes, you've been exposed to Agent Orange dioxin, and therefore we're going to compensate you because we know that's where your illness comes from. So this has been an ongoing struggle. The child whose picture you see at the front of the screen is a picture of a child from about 1972-1973. At that time, I was very active in an organization called Medical Aid for Indochina, and we worked with the Vietnamese, we worked with staff at Bac Mai Hospital to be able to provide medical supplies for people who were injured because we were dropping bombs on Vietnam and killing people. This child's picture was sent to us by the Vietnamese from Hanoi, and it said, Agent Orange Dioxin is causing these kinds of problems with our children. We have never seen this problem before. So this is not new news, whether it, we're talking about the corporations or the government or the military. Again, this goes back many, many years. This is a picture of Aloe. Um, it could be almost anywhere in Vietnam. You can see the lush foliage and the beauty of the landscape. These are the areas where the United States had military bases, and this is, again, South and Central Vietnam. Um, all up and down Vietnam during In the Land, 28 different bases. I wanted to show you a picture about how the Agent Orange dioxin was used. Most of us have the image that it was sprayed from planes and helicopters, and that's how most of it was delivered. But it also was sprayed at the periphery around the bases, intensively, into the land, and remains there today. 28 different bases. The picture was taken by an American veteran who was in Vietnam. And you can see how close the soldiers were to it because everybody told them it wouldn't harm them. It wouldn't harm them. So they used the barrels in which the Agent Orange dioxin came to Vietnam. They used them for barbecue pits. They used it to take showers. They sat next to it. They swam in the water that was contaminated. And you think about, how do you do this, you know, to your own soldiers? But also think about the people in Vietnam. There have been studies that have identified about 3.4 million Vietnamese were sprayed directly by the Agent Orange dioxin. That is exposed directly, and they're Dr. Stellman's studies. Dr. Gene Stellman from Columbia University. 
Again, we don't know how much exponentially then that contamination continues into the gram through the parental transmission. And this is the other way the Agent Orange was delivered. By the C-123 aircraft, and I just want to quickly mention, there was a study that came out within the last four to five months that finally proves that when the C-123s were washed down by soldiers, these are people that were not involved in the spraying, were not in Vietnam, but they were responsible for washing down the aircraft which contained the Agent Orange dioxin, that we have seen, seen the same incidence of disease as we have seen in those American soldiers who were in Vietnam from 1961 to 1975. Same incidence of disease. So the studies continue. And what a lot of us say is that it's the gift that keeps on giving. You saw the scenes of alloy before the use of the Agent Orange dioxin. This is what it looked like right after the spraying. And as you can see, it was relatively effective. There is nothing that escaped it. This young man lives in Taiyuan province, which was one of the areas that was badly affected. He has severe autism, and I know we read a lot today about the issues in this country of autism, and maybe the correlation between exposure to environmental hazards and the development of autism. And this young child's father was impacted and sprayed by the Agent Orange dioxin. I just think he's a dramatic example of what can happen through the exposure. The theories today deal with what we call epigenetic concerns or transmission. So it's not the change in our DNA, and I know a lot of people talk about that. But what we think happens is that people have vulnerabilities to certain illnesses and certain diseases, and that by exposure to environmental toxins, they can develop different types of diseases. So we're talking not just about the individual adult exposure, but the transmission from the adult to the child that can go on forever from generation to generation. This child I met on my first trip to Vietnam and was introduced to him. You can see that they live in a very poor environment. There is no electricity in the house. The power comes through pulling wires through to the house next door. But when our interpreter told us about this young man, he said, he's 25 years old. And I said, they must have made a mistake, right? He can't be 25 years old. He's 25 months old. And they said, no, the father was sprayed by the Agent Orange dioxin. This is now the mother's ongoing responsibility. The father died, and the mother has three children. This is one of her children. One of the others is disabled, and, and the third one is okay. She can only go out to the garden to work and has a small rice paddy beyond the house. But this is one of the children's and one of the legacies of the American involvement in Vietnam. This child is in, you can see, is, is kind of happy at home and they live in a better environment. The woman's husband was one of the soldiers who went from the north to the south to fight. He died several years ago. He came back, he developed liver cancer, and he died. This is their child, who is about 30 years old now. The child responds to voices 
and responds to touch and obviously smiles. Um, it's kind of extraordinary. And one of the things I thought when I was there was yes, and if they had the money to provide services, they could change the life of both the mother and the child. Because you can do work with children who have these kinds of impairments, but we don't. And so they live on a poverty level, and this is all they have. This young woman was born like this. She has severe cerebral palsy. She's got some mental retardation. And I think, to me, the most extraordinary thing is that the mother can understand the child's verbal cues and can give her what she wants. But if you take a look at the wheelchair, it was donated by an American organization, and it gives the mother an opportunity to be able to take the child outside. But that's about it. This again are people who have been harmed by the use of Agent Orange dioxin in their land, um, and it continues. This is in way, so we're talking about another city and another province. Um, the gentleman was part of the North Vietnamese Army. When he came back, his wife had the son. The son, as you can see, is terribly disfigured. This again is from the father's exposure. And the son also has terrible chloracne on his back. He doesn't know anybody. Um, and he has to be carried around and cared for continuously. This is a recent picture at Catholic Orphanage in Vietnam. And you can see the impact on the kids, again, from the land, from the food, because the dioxin remains in the land. And I'll quickly mention that there is a Canadian consultant firm by the name of Hatfield that takes a look and does studies on the land and on the continuous exposure in Vietnam. The most recent studies they've done have been around Da Nang, um, where they found continuing contamination of the land. And while there is continuing contamination of the land and the water, the food supply also gets contaminated because the dioxin stays in the fatty tissues of both the animals as well as the people. These children were born about two or three years ago, and we think that part of the problem was the parental exposure through the food supply in the land. And this is a picture from Peace Village. It was a village that was started in the 1990s by an American veteran who served in Vietnam, George Miso, who brought in other countries and NGOs to be able to take care of the children who had been harmed by the Agent Orange dioxin. I wanted to show you these pictures to show what can be done and how the quality of life of children can be changed if we only can provide those services. So they get together at mealtime, they're taught computer skills, and taught how to embroider. And there's some beautiful and lovely products that are produced. These children can become productive members of their society again if they're provided with the resources. And I would just suggest that it is our responsibility to make sure that that happens. That what was done in Vietnam was done in the name of the American people. And that we have a responsibility to help them, to resolve the issues, and to continue the struggle. As George mentioned, we have orange cards out there. So let me tell you about HR 2519. 
It is legislation that we had, our group, had introduced to Congress two years ago and then a year ago. Um, the major sponsor of legislation is Representative Barbara Lee from California. And what the legislation wants to do is to make sure that we provide services for the children of American veterans who served in Vietnam, that we provide services for the Vietnamese who have been harmed, that we take care of the Vietnamese Americans who live in this country, and that we clean up the land in South Vietnam that remains contaminated from the United States bases. What we want to do, again, those of us who work on this campaign, and I'll tell you the name of the campaign, but I'm not so sure you'll remember it, except by its initials. It's the Vietnam Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign, VERA. We are an organization of American veterans, of social and peace activists, along with our sister organization, Vietnam, the Vietnamese Association for the Victims of Agent Orange. And we believe that by working together, Americans and Vietnamese, as former enemies of a conflict, that we can begin to heal the wounds of war. So part of what we want to do is to educate people that this is so important, that the enemy of our government is not necessarily our enemy, that we have responsibilities, and that we need to do something about the terrible destruction that has been caused by our government. I just want to also mention that I worked for many, many years with the Vietnamese in the late 60s, early 70s. And one of the constant messages I heard at that time and that I hear today is that you're not our enemy, it's your government. We know that the American people didn't want to harm us. Even during the worst stages of the war, when we were bombing civilian cities like Hanoi, when we were trying to destroy the dikes that would cause unimaginable harm and flood the land. In the midst of all of this, this was the message from the Vietnamese, and it continues today. So what we would like to do is to say to everybody, it's possible to reconcile former enemies that we do have a responsibility to do that. And we can do this through supporting the legislation. So everybody, before you leave tonight, please fill out this card with your name, address, and email number. And I'll take them because we're collecting them and we will be going to your representatives in Congress. It would be even better if you would. But we would love to work with you and have you talk with your representatives and say concretely, this is legislation we would like you to become a co-sponsor of. Heather Bowser is a young woman whose father served in Vietnam. Heather was born missing a right lower leg. She has webbed fingers. You can see the birth defects that her father transferred to her. He died when he was about 50 years old from terrible cardiac problems that were a result of his exposure to the Agent Orange dioxin. Heather today is very active in an organization called the Children of Vietnam Health Alliance. And she works and talks to groups of people to say, look at me, I am an example of what happened because my father served in Vietnam. These are the children who had nothing to do with the war. 
who had these problems. Heather went to Vietnam and met with this young man, Bang, and if you look at them closely, you'll see that they both have the same birth defects. They're mirror images of each other. And again, one of the reasons we feel our campaign is so important and our message is so important is to bring together former enemies and heal the wounds of war. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm very uh, honored to uh, appear on the same uh, bill tonight uh, with Susan. Um, I first uh, actually saw Susan on a, in a movie called Sir No Sir, uh, and uh, she was explaining uh, why she dropped the leaflets against the war. Uh, out of an airplane flying over Berkeley, California. No, oh, and uh, she was uh, court martialed for that and uh, discharged from uh, the Navy, am I right? And uh, so uh, she's really been uh, at the front line of uh, civil resistance around uh, these atrocities. I want to uh, just introduce this uh, uh, thing here. Uh, this is a replica of a, a MQ-9 Reaper drone. And this is a drone that when you hear about attacks uh, in Afghanistan or Pakistan, in Yemen, Somalia, um, really even in the Philippines, this is most likely the, the uh, weapon that's used. The real one is five times bigger than this. It has a wingspan of 66 feet. The body is 36 feet long. And these uh, black uh, missiles here are about, the real ones are about five feet long. And uh, those are called Hellfire missiles. And the uh, khaki colored bombs are uh, models of 500 pound bombs. And these are used uh, against uh, people in cars. Uh, in the field, in houses, um, and I'm going to show you uh, briefly a video of Hellfire missile explosion because uh, our government and the president specifically speak to us about the precision of Hellfire missiles and of drone attacks. So um, I'll do that, and then I want to tell you about something called the Drone Control Act, and then I want to relate this to what Susan was speaking about. Okay. Probably a, a lot of you might have a hard time seeing this clearly, but this, is, this was produced um, by Lockheed Martin as a promotional video for the Hellfire missile. And for those who were in the back, uh, basically, it's being used against houses, uh, tanks, and uh, armored vehicles. And so, the blast radius uh, for this particular weapon is about 60 feet. Anybody within that area stands a chance of being uh, killed or, or maimed. So, when a Hellfire missile is uh, uh, sent, uh, let's say, to uh, attack Murray over here, in this room precisely uh, because he is uh, in favor of single-payer health care. <laughs> All of us are going to be killed along with Murray. And so what you have in these places where there are supposed to be uh, evil people who are enemies, who are singled out precisely and carefully, other people are going to die with them. But we have to remember that these people are being killed without the benefit of a, of a trial. So when people say civilians and innocent people are being killed, in fact, every single person who is killed in a drone attack is, under the law, an innocent person. 
And when we speak about, we talk about signature strikes, which are against people who generally appear to be 16 or 17 years old, and they might be a threat. In a way, that's a, trying to make it so, well, maybe we shouldn't do those anymore, but then these other ones, those are okay. You know, because we really do know who that is, and then we find, oh, well, people have been attacked simply because their cell phone signal had been scooped by the NSA, and maybe somebody stole their cell phone, maybe they didn't, and so this idea of precise killing of enemies is really for our consumption here. The people in these villages where this is happening know perfectly well that this is an attack against the general population for reasons they may or may not know the reason for. And I'm also going to play now another uh, video, and I'm playing it for the sound rather than so much uh, for the, uh, you know, what you'll see. Shame to just wanting to 
could go there out of ignorance, a uh, sense of adventure and this uh, rather um, sorry way of viewing the world. Um, and I worked in the, in the building office. I was in the Navy, but at that time the Navy was just doing supply corps types of work, not being in combat. And so in the evenings after work, we'd go to our quarters um, and people would, you know, have drinks in their officer club and, and this and that. And there were people there from what's called DARPA, which is basically a branch of the Pentagon where they do research, where uh, a lot of the idea of Agent Orange was cooked up. And uh, they, they uh, were talking at that time about how they were going to essentially uh, prevail over the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong by constructing a barrier of, of sound sensors and, and other kinds of sensing devices that would be across the whole country between North and South to alert people to, you know, when people were coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, and this, this technology was going to be, you know, indomitable. And I don't know if any of you have stood on the deck of an aircraft carrier, but if you have, it's very hard to imagine that anything could prevail against the power that you have. And this kind of thing translates into all kinds of technology. Well, needless to say, this, this sensors didn't work. Susan, you know, told me that one of the things that I did not know about is, and I'll let you tell it during the question period, but there are a lot of things about technology that are imperfect, but if there's one thing that is in common with what's happening then, or what, what happened then and what happened now, is that people in this country, people in the military, are being sold on technology as the way to overcome, to prevent us from having to, you know, uh, lose forces, from, you know, that this was going to save lives in Vietnam to have these sensors because they would set up, you know, an alarm, you could send your airplanes, you could bomb the hell out of everything in, in that area. Well, it didn't work. And at this point, the United States government still defends the use of herbicides as, a, as their God-given right to use in war. And there are a number of other countries that, that still do this. In this court case, 2006, the, the U.S. government uh, introduced a, a brief saying that what happened uh, with Agent Orange is not subject to international law. Indeed, it's under the purview exclusively of the Commander-in-Chief. John F. Kennedy made decisions to use this based on what was good for, for combat at that time, and there's no challenge to this. And then furthermore, they said that there was no law that Congress had passed that could apply to the use of, of, of herbicides, Agent Orange. In the case of drones, we have no laws that have been passed by the Congress having anything to do with drones, except to say that they will be introduced if the will of Congress is, is followed, they will be introduced into U.S. airspace September 15, 2015, to fly any time, any time, anywhere they want. So we have that same pattern again. We will uh, have no idea of morality or, or consequence in law for military technology and, and, and for drones. Now, the thing I want, I want to get at, I think most uh, importantly tonight, is a question that comes up from time to time. Well, we have uh, climate change going on. We have people unemployed, student loans, uh, environmental degradation. Um, why should you know people work on drones exclusive of these other things, or, or how do we set priorities for what for what we do? And I think that, that's a really good question because anyone who's got any kind of a conscience at all and, and feels the, the disintegration of, of uh, the economy and, and social structure wants to do something. I would, what I guess I come down to the, to, to the opinion that a reason to give drones a high priority, if not the highest priority, number one, 
is the government is actively killing people with these things. And the environment and climate change, the government is passively killing people, but not as a direct cause and effect. People are dying because of the, the complicity of the government with uh, petroleum companies, with chemical companies, with, a, with people who are degrading the society and the economy, with, with oil, with uh, gas fracking. And these are all things that are very destructive. But this is a different case. We have a, a, a government here that is actively killing people without any remorse, without any explanation, and refusing to provide information about essentially assassination and murder. Now, in ourselves, I think we have to find a place to, to say and to stand under shifting ground, a place to stand and say, this is totally unacceptable. This is not something we can live with. This is, this is not something we would live with here, of people going to be singled and grabbed off the street and summarily executed. But this is essentially what's, what's happening. Second point, if, if you know, uh, we have to move back into what the self-interest is in this. Um, if we look where this killing is going on, these are places that are under heavy contest between local people who want to control their own resources and international corporations, abetted by the U.S. government, who want to control those resources, oil, minerals, labor, water, land. These are all things that are more and more short supply, if you want to say, more and more contested. There's a book called Race for What's Left by Michael Clare that talks a lot about this competition. And so where you look and see killing by drones, what you see is a struggle between people who want to control their oil, let's say, so that they can measure it out and control prices and not have the entire you know, you know, patrimony of that country exhausted within 10 years. So those people are more likely to actually want to protect those resources and keep them in the ground for a longer period of time rather than burn and plunder every single thing they possibly can. Yes, it'll cost more money. Yes, that means that our prices would rise. Yes, that might mean that solar energy would be a lot relatively, a lot more cheap, relatively speaking. So we have to, I, I would argue, I, I guess, for people who have an environmental concern have to be much more willing to engage the possibility that unless this military problem is, is examined correctly, we can't really get at the basic issues around environment because there will always be a cheaper place to, place to go and as this country becomes more bankrupt, now fracking gas is going to be the way that we support the United States and it came up, well, will frack gas now be sent to Europe to replace you know, the, the, the gas that we don't want Europe to buy. So when we talk about sanctions against, against Europe and, you know, and there's always a gun in the back, you know, in the back while this conversation is going on, what we're really talking about is a way of drawing European countries much more into some kind of dependency not necessarily to the benefit of the people of the United States, but for a very few corporations and banks that are coming in. So when this thing is sitting here and we're told this is about attacking terrorists, this is really an instrument of mass control that is going to be used against every single person in this world if the, if the people behind us get their way. And I, and I think that's a hard thing to face up to because a lot of people really don't want to get involved with military stuff. Their personality, their disposition is all around things that grow and things that make you feel like, yeah, this is, this is beautiful. You know, I love kids. I want to give them food. You know, I want to, you know, have gardens. I want to have farms. I want to have things that are, that are good. And we have to have that. But it, this kind of thing has to fit in somewhere in this equation of how we want to rebuild the United States because, in my opinion, I don't think we can do that 
while this is going on. And, and in terms of emotionally, morally, this kind of thing undercuts people's spirit. Their spiritual base is totally eroded when they know this is going on next to me, but I, can, I want to live my life, you know, and get by it. This is the same kind of mentality that existed in Nazi Germany. You had concentration camps. People would know, they would see the smoke coming out, they would know what's going on, but we're going to live our lives and we're going to get by this and, 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 and this and that's going to happen. These drone control bases are putting all over the country now. Syracuse, Horsham, Pennsylvania, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Des Moines, Iowa, and it just, Nashville, Tennessee, it just keeps growing that way. And you have the, the moral weight on people in that community where you have young men and women going to work every day to actually be executioners. They say, well, we're flying a plane, we're doing this, we're doing that, but actually they're expected to go into this building, into this trailer every single day and be willing to kill people. And when you see this movie called Unmanned, uh, America's Throne Wars, and they interview one of these people who have, who have done this, you see here's a I mean, he's a well-spoken person in a certain way, but you can also see he's a very emotionally troubled person. And this is happening to tens of thousands of people who have passed through these little buildings in these dark places. And it's just like what you're talking about with Agent Orange and the, 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 the residue of suffering and, and sorrow. Same thing with this. So, I feel like we all need to step back and take a breath and look and say, okay, how, how do we address this rather than avoid this in relation to the other things that we're, we're trying to work on? So anyway, um, I, I think I've hit the main point. And uh, I would just, uh, I will say that, you know, we'll, we hope that people from here, and I, I will probably go to L.A. Engel's office with us and speak with the staff. I think that needs to be done in principle. But I, I, I think we need to be very, very scratching our heads about how do we engage other people in this and, and explain things in a way that is, let's say, in a holistic way rather than that we just don't like, you know, drone killing. Because this is a really um, very profound thing that's being done now in our name in a way that seems very harmless to the general public, but will have profound effects on people. So thank you.